Today's video lecture is going to be on the topic of viruses. Please make sure you're filling in your notes organizer as you watch the video, making sure you answer every question. Now, we're entering into our bacteria and virus unit. This is one of my favorite units of the whole year because I know this stuff is interesting to you guys. This is real life stuff. You hear about this all the time, but now we get into the nitty gritty of the biology, which to me is really exciting. So let's start by talking about what is a virus. A virus is a non-living particle that depends on a host to reproduce. Now, viruses are sometimes considered to exist on the edge of life, which means they're not technically organisms, they're not technically alive, but they have some of those characteristics of living things. Now, I will use the term organism to refer to a virus all the time. I mean, a lot of scientists do, but technically they are non-living, so something to keep in the back of your mind. Why are they considered non-living? Well, they don't exhibit all of those characteristics of living things that we learned about way at the beginning of the year. So let's refresh our memory. What are those characteristics of life? So here's our list. They have genetic material. They have to evolve. They have to reproduce, respond to their environment, made of cells, use energy, grow and develop, maintain homeostasis, and display organization. Do you remember that? Hopefully ringing a bell deep in your brain. So the characteristics of life that viruses do have are that they have genetic material and they're able to evolve. They are able to reproduce, but you'll see here that I have these little stars next to them because they cannot reproduce on their own. They require a host cell to reproduce. And that really is the big one, right? The fact that viruses cannot reproduce on their own and require a host cell is the big reason why we consider them to be non-living. So again, here are those um, characteristics of life, whether a virus has them or not compared to a cell. Obviously a cell does have all these characteristics, but a virus does not. Okay. So you can pause on that if you wanna take a closer look. So here are some examples of viruses. Many of these you've probably heard of, or you've heard of before. Measles, mumps, chickenpox, the cold, influenza, which is the flu, right? The virus that causes the flu. HIV, which is the virus which causes AIDS. Um, some of these you've probably heard of, some of them you have not. You're going to beco become more familiar with them through the course of this unit. So we're at a couple examples there under number three. So where in the world do these viruses come from? There are these sort of living but sort of not living things. Where did they come from? Well, evidence suggests that they actually came from broken parts of cells that sort of just started existing on their own, right? The genetic material that's inside a virus is very similar to the genetic material that's inside of cells. Um, how did they start existing outside of the cell? Well, we're not entirely sure, but we know that they are able to exist outside of a cell because they use that host cell to reproduce. Okay, now the thing about viruses is they're teeny tiny, right? If they are broken parts of cells sort of existing on their own, then it makes sense that they would be smaller than an actual cell. So here's a virus right here. Here's the influenza virus that causes the flu. Here's a bacteria, a prokaryotic cell, so definitely bigger. Did you know that a bacteria is about the same size as a mitochondria, so one little organelle? And then you put all those organelles together and you get into this size right here, so much bigger, animal cells and plant cells, but remember, still you know, invisible to the naked eye. And then here's a single grain of pollen. So think about how teeny tiny that is. And then, so about 100 micrometers, somewhere around here. And then a flu virus is about 100 nanometer. Here is a protein. So you can sort of see that viruses are teeny tiny. So put those in order with prokaryotic, or sorry, virus being the smallest. Then you have the prokaryotic cell, which is in the middle. And then you have the eukaryotic cell, which is the largest. So a virus consists of two main parts. They're very simple. They have an outer shell that is made of a protein, which is called the capsid, and then they have the genetic material, which is in the inside, and that genetic material is either DNA or RNA. So pick one of these viruses. This virus right here is sort of the go-to example of a virus to draw as your little picture and make sure you label the capsid and the DNA um, especially. So that, like I said, is the go-to picture of a virus. This particular virus is called a bacteriophage. A bacteriophage is a phage, so a, a um, pathogen that infects bacteria. So it's a virus that specifically infects bacteria. We will talk a lot about these because they're very important in research. So for, like I said, this is like for some reason, when, when people think of a virus, they think of this this shape virus. In my master's program, one time our teacher said, okay, everybody draw a virus. And out of like the 15 of us in there, every single one of us drew a bacteriophage. So definitely be familiar with this structure here. All right, so like I said, viruses can't reproduce on their own. In order for them to reproduce, they have to attach to a host cell first. So they attach to these specific receptors that are on the host cell's membrane, 
and then they are able to inject their genetic materials. This is why viruses are specific to certain species, right? They can only attach to certain receptors and only certain organi organisms have certain receptors on their cells. So this is why you hear of like, oh, this type of virus only infects um, bats or this type of virus only infects humans or whatever. So the virus attached to, attaches to the host cell and then injects the genetic material. And then it enters either the, the lytic cycle or the lysogenic cycle. So we're gonna talk about the differences here. In the lytic cycle, this is where the virus turns your cells into virus-making machines. So the virus attaches to the host cell's membrane, it injects its DNA, and then basically that DNA is now in your cell and it's instructing your cell to make more viruses. So your own cells turn against you and they start making viruses. So they make so many viruses inside of the cell that eventually the cell lyses or bursts. Okay, so lice means to burst. So the cell explodes and now all those viruses that your own cells have made find another cell. So they all head out, they go find a new cell, they attach to that cell, they, they inject the DNA and they turn those cells into virus making machines. So this happens very quickly. So your viral infections <clears throat> that have symptoms appearing in one to four days, right? You feel fine one second and the next sec second you are curled up in bed because you feel like death. That is because that virus probably goes through the lytic cycle. So these are um, more active infections like the cold or the flu or those sinus infections, right? It's a very short cycle. You feel fine one second, you feel horrible the next, um, but the symptoms themselves only last for a couple of days. Okay, so describe this for number 10. Um, making sure you know some examples here. Now, the lysogenic cycle is a little more complicated. This is like the dormant cycle. So once again, the virus attaches to the host cell. It has to do that first. It injects the DNA just like it does in the other cycle. But in this cycle, the DNA of the virus actually incorporates into your own DNA. And then it just sort of lays dormant, hangs out in your cell, um, while your cell does its normal cell thing, so the cell is growing, the cell is dividing, okay, going through the cell cycle. And now as the cells divide, they're all dividing with this viral DNA just hanging out inside of them. And eventually, those infected cells are going to lay dormant, but eventually they're going to activate, right? Like if you get really stressed out, this is why like when you get stressed out, sometimes you get sick because your immune system is weakened during that time. So when those viruses activate within your own DNA, they then enter into the lytic cycle. So now you're gonna see you know, the, the DNA instructing the cell to make viruses and all of a sudden you're gonna see um, symptoms. So these are more latent or passive infections. They can remain dormant for years. So all of your viruses that have like periods of um, no symptoms and then periods of symptoms, those are all because they are lysogenic cycle viruses. So like herpes, someone who has herbi herpes may go through times where they have no symptoms at all and then they have like what's considered almost like a flare-up where they have symptoms. Same with HIV, someone who has AIDS goes through periods where they are feeling great and then other times where their immune system is, is quite depressed. Okay, so lysogenic cycle. So describe that, give some examples there. And then the thing about the lytic cycle and the lysogenic cycle is that you can go from the lysogenic cycle to the lytic cycle. That's when you start experiencing symptoms. So use the space on number 13 to pause on this picture and draw and label what's happening. Okay, take a few minutes to do a good drawing here. Some of your drawings are quite questionable on your notes organizer, but you really need to understand this. So in the lytic cycle, the virus attaches, it injects DNA. In the lytic cycle, it breaks up your DNA and, in, and now is instructing your own cell to make viruses, okay? So your cell fills full of viruses that it itself is making. Eventually it bursts, all those viruses get released to make more viruses. In the lysogenic cycle, that DNA actually incorporates itself into your cell's DNA. Your cell does its normal cell thing. It grows, it divides, it produces new cells with that viral DNA inside of it until eventually um, those cells activate and now they go through the lytic cycle and that's when you start feeling sick. A retrovirus, most viruses have DNA at their core, but a retrovirus actually has RNA at its core and reverse transcriptase enzymes. So think about that, reverse transcription. Transcription is when you go from DNA to RNA. So in reverse transcription, we're starting with RNA inside of the virus. It's injecting RNA into the cell 
And then it basically uses that RNA to make viral DNA and incorporates it into your cell. So an example of a retrovirus, the most common example of a retrovirus is HIV, the virus that causes AIDS. And then finally, we're going to end by talking about vaccines. I'm just going to give you a little intro here because we'll talk more about vaccines in class. But uh, you need to know the term pathogen. A pathogen is anything that causes disease. So it could be a virus. It could be bacteria, um, some forms of protists, some forms of uh, fungi. But anything that causes disease is a pathogen. A vaccine is a biological development that allows the immune system to develop a memory of certain pathogens. Vaccines are preventative. They are for viral infections. They are to prevent you from getting a certain virus. Not bacteria, just virus. So basically, there are different forms of viruses, but they pretty much use an altered version of, a pa of the pathogen, of the virus, to trigger an, Im an immune response in your body, which causes you to produce antibodies. So they, give, they expose you to some form of the virus, which causes your body to, to produce antibodies so that when you're exposed to the actual virus, sorry about that, your body can actually fight it off. Okay, so a vaccine is a preventative measure to prevent you from getting sick when you are exposed to the actual virus. You've already produced the antibodies, so you can fight, off, fight it off when you are exposed to the real thing. And here are some common vaccines for some viruses that we are able to prevent. And we'll talk more about these in class. And that's it for today. Um, so again, make sure you've answered every question and I hope you're having a great day. Bye.